Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and many thanks to the organizers for inviting me to give this lecture, and thanks to all of you for being here. I hope you will enjoy the presentation. Why would you like to introduce uh, monoclonal antibodies for treatment of uh, multiple myeloma? Uh, it would offer us an immunotherapy that could work together with the host's immune system against the malignant cells. And it has um, a history behind it because we know from the treatment of diffuse large B cell lymphomas from this Canadian uh, study that if we look at the outcomes of patients with diffuse large B cell lymphomas after the int introduction of rituximab in combination with CHOP compared to the um, previous years where only CHOP was given for this disease, um, the results of the treatment has improved greatly. So the hope is that we for multiple myeloma will see something similar, that introduction of antibodies along with other treatments that are efficient for multiple myeloma will see a major improvement in the outcomes. The dream of monoclonal antibodies as magic bullets in cancer has a long history, coming back from Paul Ehrlich's uh, early observations and thoughts. But we had to wait uh, because Polyclonal antibodies are not well suited for treatment of uh, patients. It creates a lot of problems and side effects. So we had to wait until these two gentlemen discovered the technology that is behind the production of monoclonal antibodies. This is the humble paper they pu uh, published. And their statement is also quite modest, I think. Uh, their conclusion of the finding here is that such cells can be grown in vitro in massive cultures to provide specific antibodies. Such cultures could be valuable for medical and, and industrial use. I think that's an uh, understatement that um, we can all uh, very much appreciate that it has had terrific impact on our uh, clinical situation, their invention. The basis is that you have um, a immortal cell that is a myeloma cell without its own secretion of antibody. By chemical treatment, you can make it fuse with a B cell that has been primed to the desired uh, antigen by immunization. And the outcome will be some hybridomas and after rep uh, repeated cloning, you can select clones that are immortal and secrete the desired antibody. So this is the basis of the monoclonal antibody technology. Uh, from their discovery until the clinical uh, application, first we had a step where um, antibodies were used uh, extensively for diagnostic purposes in hematology, classifying leukemias in new ways, lymphomas in new ways, so we had a long development from the late uh, 70s through the 80s where um, there was a dramatic uh, change in classification of leukemias and lymphomas based on the use of monoclonal antibodies. But the th uh, ther therapeutic use of uh, monoclonal antibodies <coughs> became a reality first in 1982 where um, anti monoclonal antibody was used for treatment of a lymphoma patient. And of course, it has limitations to use a, an anti-idiotypic antibody because you have to generate an antibody for each individual patient. So the real breakthrough came when uh, one was targeting uh, more widely expressed antigens such as the CD20 antigen <coughs> with an antibody as rituximab. And that what, uh, came through in uh, 1993. Uh, a few years later, FDA approved rituximab for treatment of lymphomas, and this became the first uh, monoclonal antibody to treat cancer. And uh, uh, a year later, uh, later uh, EMA approved uh, rituximab for treatment of lymphomas. 
monoclonal antibodies can be modified in uh, various ways to meet the uh, wishes we have uh, uh, to uh, govern their activity. Uh, one process is called humanization. You start off with a murine antibody from your clones, and you want to make this more like a human antibody to avoid uh, reactions when you infuse it into the patient. So most of the antibodies in clinical use are in origin uh, mouse antibodies, but they are humanized. Another thing you can do to modify the activity of the antibody is to play with the FC part of the molecule <coughs> by genetic modifications. One example is the development of obunutuzumab from rituximab, where you, have, where you can improve complement activation and FC receptor binding by cha uh, changes in the FC part of the antibody. So most of the clinically used monoclonal antibodies are humanized. Uh, some are fully human antibodies, such as the antibodies derived from GeneMap, because uh, they have a mice, mouse strain that has, uh, carries the human IgG gene and can only pr produce human IgG antibodies. So here we have the fully human antibody. In theory, you should have less reactions to this because there will always, in the human eyes, be some mouse parts left. How do they work? <coughs> they bind, uh, the antibodies bind to the surface of a target cell, a tumor cell, and as a consequence, natural killer cells that have FC receptors on the surface can be recruited, interact with the FC part of the antibody, and kill the target cell. This process is called ADCC, antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. Macrophages also have FC receptors on the surface, and they can interact with the FC region of the antibody bound to the target cell and mediate phagocytosis. Furthermore, complement can become activated by interaction with the FC part of the antibody and elicit complement-mediated cytotoxicity and kill the tumor cells. A fourth possibility is that the interaction of the antibody with the surface molecules of the target cell directly can induce apoptosis and kill the tumor cells. When we are speaking about multiple myeloma, we have a number of targets we could think about uh, working with. Some of them are signaling molecules and we already have for clinical use uh, an antibody to rank ligand and can, that can inhibit uh, the development of bone disease. But today I will focus more on some of the surface molecules that are expressed by the myeloma cell, in particular the CD38 molecule, which is not specific for myeloma cells but quite widely expressed in the human body but it's very highly expressed on the myeloma cell, and that may be the reason why it's a suitable target for a clinical treatment. The CS1 molecule is more specific for the myeloma cell and also of interest in clinical development of monoclonal antibodies. So here's a list where we have the ilotuzumab antibody developed by bristol myers Squibb, targeting the CS1 antigen, which is specific for myeloma cell. The other target I, was, I want to speak about is the CD38 antigen, where we have three antibodies in uh, clinical development, daratumumab by GeneMap and Janssen, the SAR antibody by Sanofi, and the morphosis antibody originally coming from Munich in Germany, but now in clinical development uh, with help from cell gene. The rank ligand antibody, Dinosumab, uh, is used for 
um, already in the clinic, it's uh, registered and can be used to treat um, myeloma bone disease. So in my uh, coming talk, I will focus on ilotuzumab, daratumumab, and the SAR antibody that are most uh, far advanced in the clinical development. The CS1 molecule uh, is expressed by the myeloma cell and can be targeted by ilotuzumab. It's uh, uh, almost always expressed to quite a substantial uh, in quite substantial numbers on myeloma cells, so we rarely see cells that are uh, negative. But when we uh, first started using the antibody as a single agent, uh, first in human study, the response to the antibody was quite disappointing. However, in the early development in phase one, it was also combined with lenalidomide and bortezomib. And here, in particular, in the combination with lenalidomide, we did see interesting things in the phase one part of the development. We saw 82% partial responses, and that is why this combination of um, ilotuzumab, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone is taken into phase two and phase three trials. So the phase one trial was expanded into a phase two trial, and from the dose escalation, they had found that there was no maximal tolerated dose. They could go up to 20 milligram per kilo given every second week but they decided also to test the 10 milligram per kilo dosing in the phase two trial. The antibody was given along with the standard dosing of lenalidomide of 25 milligrams per day for 21 out of 28 days with dexamethasone 40 milligrams given once weekly. The results showed that both Dose levels were efficient with an overall response rate of 92 and 76 percent, and also development of complete responses and stringent complete responses. Seemingly, there was a, different in a diff difference in favor of the lower dose of ilotuzumab, but the numbers of patients are not big, and I think one should be a bit cautious about interpreting this. But both the response rates and the duration of the response and progression-free su survival are actually in favor of the lower dose of ilotuzumab of 10 milligrams per kilo. How can we understand this? Is it so that in some cases, less is better than more? There is a recent paper from Blood that brings into our attention the process of trogocytosis, which is kind of uh, a process where you have a kind of nibbling of material from the plasma membrane of a target cell by antibody bound to an FC receptor on an effector cell. And as a result, the target cell will become negative for the antigen that is considered the target to kill the tumor cell, but since it becomes naked, the antibody will no longer work. So in this interesting paper, the authors propose that we should look very carefully to alternative dosing schedules and perhaps find out ways where we can suppress trogocytosis as one mechanism where cancer cells can, expect, uh, can ex uh, escape killing by monoclonal antibodies. The side effects of the treatment with ilotuzumab, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone are quite uh, mild. The most common 
are the ones we know from treatment with lidandidomide and dexamethasone, gastrointestinal, and some uh, neutropenia and thrombocytopenia, not much contributed by the antibody, except for some infusion-related reactions that are seen, especially in the first and second infusion of the antibody. Next, I'll turn to speak about the CD38 uh, membrane glycoprotein. When we started um, working on antibody treatment of using uh, this type of antibody, CD38 antibody, we were very nervous because the antigen is so widely expressed in the human body. I don't think you can, you can mention any cell in the human body that does not have CD38 on it. It is in the brain, it's on neuro peripheral nerves, it's in the heart muscle, in the, in the, in the skeletal muscles, it's, it's everywhere. Erythrocytes, platelets, all leukocytes express T38. But myeloma cells have very, very high expression, and from preclinical studies, it was found that T38 could be an interesting target. So the um, preparations of tr uh, treating patients uh, with this approach were very, very careful, starting with extremely low dosing of the antibody, observing the patients for extending, uh, extended periods, treating only one patient at a time. So it took a long, long way from the early part of the development until today this process was started back in 2007. So uh, at the present time, we have two antibodies in uh, quite advanced clinical development. One is Dartumumab, uh, coming from GeneMap and now in, developed in collaboration with Janssen. And the other is the SAR antibody uh, developed by Sanofi. Both of them have uh, demonstrated in vitro activity, also as single agents without anything added. This is uh, different from the ilotuzumab antibody that only has meaningful clinical activity when it's combined with, combined with lindidomide. So coming back to the development of daratumumab, this was developed in a phase one trial where we started almost with pure water treating the first patients with 0.005 milligrams per kilo of body weight. Uh, so I think you should really realize in this development that some patients are extremely brave. They have end-stage myeloma. They are told, yes, we have a compound we want to treat you with. It could be dangerous for you and it probably has no effect because we give it at a, in a very low dosing. But even in these conditions, some patients say yes and go into that clinical uh, trial. So with, with these brave patients, we were able to gra gradually um, expand on the dosing up to the target of 25 milligrams per kilo. And in the first part of the study, the phase one, the patients were only treated for eight weeks with single agent antibody. There was no uh, maximal tolerated dose, so this uh, upper limit could be reached with no problems except from the infusion related reactions I will come back to. And we could expand into the phase two part of the study and extend the number of patients and also the duration of the treatment from eight weeks in part one, for safety reasons, to two years in part two, where we were more confident in the safety. In the part two trial, eight and 16 milligrams per kilo were used as the doses to go further with, and the schedule is eight once-weekly infusions, then eight bi-weekly infusions every second week, and then monthly infusions up to two years. So the conclusion was that we could go up to 24 milligrams. It was well tolerated. And 
up to 42% achieved a PR, and this was the first time a response was seen in myeloma to a monoclonal antibody given as single agent. If you compare the dose levels in the uh, study, 8 and 16 milligrams per kilo, in contrast to the ilotuzumab um, uh, study, you seem to have better responses with a higher dosing, 35% overall response rates compared to 10, and a trend for a longer progression-free survival with a higher dosing. So from now on, 16 milligram per kilo of daratumumab is the dosing the company is going further with in clinical trials. Since we knew now that the CD38 antibody was safe to use as a single agent, we wanted to combine it with other antimyeloma treatments. And the first step was to take it out in clinical testing in combination with linalidomide and dexamethasone in the same way as ilotuzumab was tested except for a different dosing schedule of the antibody. Again here, linalidomide is given the usual way, 25 milligrams in 21 days out of 28, dexamethasone also 40 milligrams week, once weekly, daratumumab uh, coming down from two and escalating up to 16 milligrams per kilo in this new combination study. We had weekly dosing eight times, bi-weekly dosing eight times, and then monthly dosing after that. These are the results you can see here from the part one study where the patients were dosed with two, four, eight, and 16 milligrams per kilo in three, uh, uh, patients, in e with three, three patients in each uh, dose level. Uh, you can see a very impressive response with a drop of the M component. All of the patients had a more than PR and quite a number of the patients had a more a uh, hundred percent drop in the M component. Uh, CR. In the part two uh, study, also impressive responses were seen in terms of drops of uh, M component. You get the impression that the uh, frequency of deep responses is not as good with the part two, where the patients all got 16 milligrams per kilo, which is strange. But when you see the next slide, you can understand why, because Many of the phase two patients have not been treated for a very long time. These are now in the orange color here in, the, in, in this diagram, and they have only received treatment with daratumumab, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone for a short period, like three or four or six months, and that explains why they have not yet obtained a very good response. You can see here, if you compare part one with part two, that part two is not as good. But when you look at the number of cycles in part two, the patients have achieved, you can see that they are improving from two to four to six cycles, that you have a still better response to the antibody in combination with lenalidomide and dexamethasone. Um, the serious adverse events were quite few, and most of them were related to the uh, treatment with lenalidomide. We did see infusion-related reactions and one case of laryngeal edema in a patient that had received irradiation to this region shortly before. When we give uh, infusion in the general uh, schedule or scheme, we see some infusion-related reactions. If we try to accelerate the infusion, we see more infusion-related reactions, but they are not much different from what we experience when we give patients rituximab or other monoclonal antibodies, and they are managed in the same way as we are used to with rituximab and other monoclonal antibodies. Also, the infusion reactions are limited to the first and the second infusion, and after that, the infusions are generally to tolerated very well. So the conclusions are that we have a very impressive overall response rate, 
accelerated infusion can be done, but with a higher incidence of adverse events. We have a favorable safety profile, much better than we had expected. And now uh, daratumumab is in phase three clinical development in combination with lenalidomide and dexamethasone. The MMY3003 uh, products program for relapsed refractory myeloma patients has been completed with enrollment in March this year, much before anticipated. And we are now starting a frontline uh, treatment uh, program, MMY3008 via, uh, which is expect to start very expected to start very soon, and uh, is reserved for the elderly, newly diagnosed myeloma patients. So I can briefly touch on a number of uh, other findings with uh, daratumumab. Um, this is uh, an open-label multicenter phase 1b trial where daratumumab is combined with, with what is co considered to be backbone regimens in multiple myeloma. The data were presented by Philippe Moreau at uh, ASH. And the backbone regimens are VD, BMP, VTD, and POM uh, dexamethasone to see if daratumumab can work with, this, with these uh, combinations without creating uh, unforeseen trouble. And this was found to be the case. Uh, we see uh, responses with all of these regimens, but the number of patients treated are still very small, so this is very preliminary data. Just to give you an, a feeling of uh, the direction where we are moving in um, and show that um, it is feasible to combine daratumumab with uh, the treatments we are using in, in multiple myeloma. The side effects are not much different from what we would expect. Infusion-related reactions are mild. One thing of note is that the patients, when they are treated with daratumumab, they become Coombs positive without having hemolysis so you should be aware of that when you treat your patients with daratumumab, they will have a positive Coombs test, but no clinically significant hemolysis. So addition of daratumumab to our usual regimens is well tolerated with promising response um, rates. Patients that have been treated with this uh, and then harvested afterwards did not have problems with stem cell mobilization and now a number of phase three studies are underway. Coming to the other CD38 antibody, the SAR antibody from Sanofi. Also this has been tested in phase one dose escalation studies as single agent and giving clinically meaningful results with partial response rates of 27%. Also here we do see uh, some infusion-related reactions, which can, most, uh, which can often be managed by the usual treatments and the, um, slowing down the infusion rate. Um, in most cases, it's great one through one, two infusion uh, reactions. Also, this antibody, the SAR antibody, has been taken out in clinical testing in combination with lenalidomide and dexamethasone for treatment of relapsed refractory myeloma. Uh, also here in a 3 plus 3 design with 3, 5, and 10 milligrams per kilo in different cohorts, and the usual scheme of the um, SAR infusion of uh, infusion on day 1, 15, um, of a 28-day cycle. The expansion cohort goes out on 10, on 10 milligrams per kilo of uh, the SAR antibody. So the response data for the combination of SAR with lenalidomide and dexamethasone are promising with an overall response rate of 58%. And the authors of this um, uh, study, uh, Martin and his co-workers, presenting it at S claim that even if they have a response rate that is not 
quite as uh, good as with the daratumumab antibody. The uh, patients that are treating are he more heavily pretreated, and therefore one would expect that the outcome would be less favorable. So this should be taken into account when you compare results from different trials. So also here we do see infusion reactions, as I said, but after cycle two, there's no problem left. One last thing I would like to uh, bring to your attention when we are speaking about treating uh, myeloma patients with monoclonal antibodies is that for, um, for this uh, disease, we rely on the demonstration of the M components by um, immunofixation and uh, uh, electrophoresis um, to demonstrate uh, disease um, being present. And when we have treated, we like to see the M component disappear. However, when you infuse a monoclonal antibody, and that goes for all of the antibodies, even the antibodies used for lymphoma treatment, such as rituximab, all of these are of IgG kappa type. And when you study the serum of the patients, you'll see an M component. That does not disturb us when we are treating lymphoma patients because we don't use the M component as a way of monitoring residual disease. But when we are treating uh, myeloma patients, it's different. If you want to claim that the patient is in complete remission, we cannot have a residual M component left in the serum of the patient. And that is the problem with daratumumab, with ilotuzumab, with the uh, SAR antibody and all of them, that they appear as an M component of IgG kappa type. Of course, if the patient originally had another type of M component, you can say that this must be daratumumab, but even then it can be disturbing. Therefore, an assay has de been developed and published um, that can allow a discrimination between daratumumab and the patient's own M component. The assay uh, relies on the use of an anti idiotypic antibody raised against daratumumab, and if you add this anti idiotypic antibody to the serum sample of the patient, it will bind to daratumumab and change the electrophoretic mobility of daratumumab so you can discriminate between M component and DARA. So you can see here as an M component, is this DARA or not? We add the antibody, and this is uh, lower uh, amounts of anti idiotypic antibody, and this is higher amounts. So if you are at higher amounts of anti idiotypic antibody, you will have a complete shift of the peak from here to this position, and you can say that the M component you were watching was actually DARA tumumab, and therefore you can go out and claim CR if the patient is negative for. M component. So my summary and conclusions are that the monoclonal antibodies present an attractive strategy in the treatment of myeloma. The uh, toxicity profile is very favorable. What is needed now? We need to define effective combinations with the antibodies. We need to find the appropriate settings, should it be frontline, maintenance, where do we use the antibodies? Is it for all patients or is it in particular for high risk disease? And what about dosing and schedules? We'll have to work <coughs> on that. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Torben, for this. Uh...